Previously on the Fan of History, the Greeks came out of the Dark Age and they learned to read and write again. Welcome to the Fan of History. I am the Fan of History and today we're going to speak about Greek archaic colonization. This is the events of the 730s BC part 2. The Archaic period is traditionally 800 to 500 BC and I will look specifically at things that happened in the 8th century BC and I will give an overview of the process of colonization of this age. This is a mammoth subject, it's gigantic and to give you a perspective of how gigantic it is um, all the episodes I've done before, my main source is Cambridge Ancient History and all the episodes, I don't know how many they are, 80? Uh, all of them have come from about 1.25 books in the Cambridge Ancient History series. This thing is almost a whole book in itself. So if I miss anything here, it's because, uh, yeah, this is a gigantic topic. So I will only touch on it briefly, but I think I will give you an overview of why it happened and how it happened. So this is what could be called Greece in a sense in the Dark Age. This is like the 9th century BC Greece. There had been a migratory period following the Dorian invasion. Basically Achaeans or Aeonians fleeing from the invading Dorians. This mostly led to colonies on the eastern Aegean coast and on the islands. Even Dorian colonies like Crete. So look at this picture and look at this picture. This is approximately what the Greek world looks like in 500 BC. So there is a major change. The Greeks are traveling everywhere. So we're going to find out how this happened and why. So was there something special about the Greeks? Why could they do this while nobody else could? Well, I would say there was something special about the Greeks and they are truly the fathers of Western civilization. Um, there is a special culture. There is their philosophy, their actual reflection on things. Uh, the fighting, the seamanship, and uh, yeah, the entire thought process. The Greeks were not limited by uh, doing things like the, everybody had done them before, as many people were in this age. And this will become even clearer than in the 5th century BC, which is the great century of ancient Greece. Uh, the sources. Um, there, is many, there are many problems with the sources. One of them is that uh, the Greeks uh, do not really become interested in recording history before Herodotus, which is why he's called the father of history. And he's much later than this. So what is written about the process of the 8th century colonization is written hundreds of years later. It, it is as if we would write about the French Revolution today without having any written sources. So, but surprisingly, archaeology confirms what most of the classical authors have to say. And the current theory is that most foundation dates given in the sources are correct. Uh, remember this island, the second largest island in the Greek, uh, in Greece, Euboea. Uh, it is ruled by the two superpowers of the Greek world in the 8th century BC, Chalcis and Eritrea. Most of the Greek ships on the Mediterranean this age are still Euboean coming from this island. We are getting close to the mighty fall of Euboea, but not yet. They are still the superpower of Greece. So, why did the Greeks colonize the Mediterranean? This subject is very heavily debated. There was overpopulation. Archaeology shows us clearly that overpopulation was taking place. There was short place. There was shortage of land. Uh, people needed more land and most of the colonists seems to have gone willingly on this trip. There are conscriptions, uh, most clearly in Thera's colonization of Cyrene. Uh, there is uh, an incident where one-tenth of the publication, uh, population was dedicated to Apollo and they had to go colonize. Uh, but archaeology shows clearly that there was a strong population increase in Greece for this period. Trade did also play a part. Some people say that colonization happened because of trade, but very few Greek colonies were founded only for trade purposes. And this makes it very different from Phoenician colonization because Phoenician colonization is all about trade, but Greek colonization have many different routes. 
And every colony has its own reasons, of course, and these reasons could be very, very different. Another question is why did the Greeks succeed in doing what they did? They were superior fighters to all the, uh, all the non-state areas they arrived at. They, they couldn't at this time match the Assyrians or maybe not even the Egyptians, but that's not where they colonized. So where they colonized with the tribal people, they met fighting forces that were inferior to them, though most colonization was not violent. They were superior sailors and they had this effective social and political organization. The polis itself lended itself very well to colonization. So you could easily trans... Oh, I have to... Okay, transplantable. The, the process was transplantable. You could found another polis and sort of run it like you have run the mother city. And it works. And it works in very different conditions. And there was a strong, a strong culture pattern with the, all the legends and stories and the Greek identity in itself that had been forged at the end of the Dark Age. So let's look at the process of establishing a colony. Somehow the decision is made to do this and it could be made by a private group or individual like a, like a business venture or a religious venture. There, it, there could also be a defeated party or exiles that had to leave the mother city and they were given the option of founding a colony or took the option of founding the colony themselves. That, those were exceptions though because the most common reason for doing a colonization was that it was a public venture of the mother city and it was an act of state. We have four foundation decrees that come down to us. They are somewhat reliable. And they all include three things. The decision itself, so that the city of so-and-so decides to found a colony. There were practical arrangements. Who gets to lead the expedition? The leader of a colonization process is called the oikistes. And we'll talk more about that shortly. There were also legal provisions. You could state the relationship between the mother city and the colonists. If the colonists could come back, etc. And we'll talk more about that too. So the Oikistes was the leader, the founder of the colony, and usually this was just one person, there are exceptions. This was often a noble, a statesman, or some other exceptional individual. It could be an Olympic champion. And his first task was to get a religious approval for this colonization. In the classical period, that is later than this, uh, the religious approval was always given by the oracle at Delphi. And later accounts uh, write in the oracle at Delphi in all stories. Um, they may very well be correct. It's very, very hard to tell. But Apollo was the main god of colonization in archaic Greece. So you come to the oracle Delphi. And if you watch my episode on oracle Delphi, you know that oracle is a scam. The priestess is high on uh, narcotic fumes and they are extremely greedy. So... The colonists learned quickly that you couldn't ask general questions like where should I fund my colony? It was much better to place the question as I am going to go to this place, found a colony, I'm going to bring 200 people, we will have five ships, etc. Should I do this or should I not? And the decree of the oracle removed all criminal guilt of taking someone else's land in case the colonization had to get violent. So then you had like the approval of the gods to actually steal people's land. And this was something that was frowned upon normally. But if the Oracle of Delphi said it was okay, it was okay. And if the colonization process failed, the Oracle of Delphi, of course, as always, was without blame. Because either the colonists had misinterpreted the Oracle's wording, or the priest that gave the Oracle wording had, misplaced, uh, had misinterpreted it. And this happened to the Phocaeans in Corsica, for example. So how many people went on the colony journey? Uh, we don't have strong evidence for this. There are some numbers. 1,000 colonists at Lucas, 200 at Apollonia, 200 at Cyrene. These are very low numbers. And some of the colonists grow enormous pretty quickly, like Pithecusa or Syracuse. But... The numbers might be true. There might be an initial small number and then they brought in more colonists or even from other Greek cities. That's not clear. So did women go on these processes? 
the Greeks did not object to intermarriage with natives, and that did happen. But uh, the Greeks themselves tended to view colonization as a very male venture, and the Greeks were not generally uh, very uh, easy on their women. So they were like, oh, men are going on the colony trip, and men are really great, and women are not great. But archaeology clearly shows that the women in the colonies, even from the very earliest dates, are, have a Greek identity. They wear Greek stuff, they, they act like Greeks. So from what I could gather, I think that almost all the expeditions, and there were many hundred, had uh, women in them. So we are about to go on the journey, but we have to do the religious preparation. So we pray, we sacrifice to the gods, we take the solemn oath that we are going to do this colonization and uh, this is what we're doing and it's gonna succeed. And we also had to bring the fire of Hestia, the goddess of the hearth. Uh, so this fire was a fire that was kept alight from the mother city until it got to the colony. Uh, and then it was kept alight. Still, you might recognize this from Vesta, the Roman goddess, and the sacred fire of Vesta in Rome. And this is the source of that. So the colonists set out on their journey. It's a perilous sea voyage. Uh, two stories come down to us about this journey happening on warships, that they were warships armed, ready for fighting. And it, it's hard to tell if this was the case for all colonizations, but uh, it's likely. The Oikistes had total power over the colonization process, and it was his decision to pick the site. And when they arrived, they could like pick a different site if they found that uh, this was unsuitable. And how they got the input for the sites, how they did the scouting for good sites, it's totally unclear. I don't have a picture of that process. If anybody knows, I would be very happy to learn. But one, two things were common to all the colonists. They were close to the sea and they had to have access to fresh water. Uh, many of them happened to be on offshore islands, peninsulas, headlines or coastal sites. And these were sites that were not very much coveted by the natives, which helped the process. So, we are in the establishment phase now. The Oikistes have several new duties. He has to name the city, he has to plan the city. And it seems from archaeology that uh, cities were actually planned very strictly from the very earliest colonizations. That they had maps, they were, had a plan, they didn't like build the colony haphazard. There, was, there had to be a wall. Almost all colonization sites are walled. You had to build houses, you had to build temples. You had to build a cemetery. And these cemeteries were often native cemeteries. Uh, if the natives had been expelled. Or if the natives were living very close by. Then you had to divide the land between the colonists. And some land had to be saved for later colonists. Uh, it seems that social differences were erased when you get to the colony, so everybody got an equal lot of land, except the Oikistes, who had total power over everything. So he was like a, a super king of the colony. He had enormous rights, uh, very different from how the mother cities were ruled. And the colonization establishment process, the phase of establishment, lasted until the Oikestes died because he had supreme power until his death. And after he was, he was dead, he was worshipped as a hero, there was often a temple built to him. And then the colony could decide on their form of government. And as you know, Greek states were ruled in many different ways. And that's a bit later, actually. But... Uh, the, the cities could choose, the colony could choose how it wanted to rule themselves. And the default was to use the same system as the mother city. So we have to talk about the relationship to the mother city, because this is a very complicated question. This is a book I recommend if you want to read more about this. But the colony often began as a cultural copy of the mod mother city. They took the cults, calendars, dialect, the script, the state offices and the citizen divisions because citizens were divided after the Oikestes had died. And there were also the graves of the ancestor was, ancestors still in the mother cities. You had this urge to go back and visit your ancestors' graves. But the colony was 
most often, almost all the time, its own entity. There was not a tradition of city-states ruling other city-states. So the city-state of the colony was independent. Uh, and often the colonies preserved customs of the mother city that were later abandoned in the mother city but still existed in the colony. Some mother cities thought they had some formal power over the colony but this, this was often not the case. And the Greeks themselves actually debated if the mother city had any right to rule the colony. And some colonies and mother cities became hostile to each other such as Corinth and Corsaira. Sorry for butchering all these Greek names. Some colonies were later victims of imperial colonization of their mother city. And I'm looking at you, Athens! The mother city could also send more colonists to a colony to fill it out with people. And they, of course the overpopulation maybe didn't stop. Maybe 20 years later you had to send people away again. Uh, colonists could often return to their mother city if they wished and sort of live on their lives in the mother city. But in some spectacular cases they were not even let into their mother city because they had to stay until the colony was a success. So we have the relation to the native peoples and maybe the most famous are the Sicils of eastern Sicily. There is flimsy evidence from Dark Age colonization. Uh, that is the colonization of the eastern Aegean coast before this, but it was often very violent. But this might be just legendary stuff. The relationship to the native peoples was opportunistic and it was very different from place to place. In Syracuse, uh, which is in eastern Sicily, they expelled the Sicils. But some, were, some of the colonists were actually invited by a ro local ruler, such as in Massalia. Uh, some relations were friendly, some relations were forceful, and some were filled with fraud. Uh, I remember specifically one instance where the colonists swore an holy oath not to attack the natives. So they brought in another colony with uh, other colonists that had not sworn this oath to beat up the natives so they could get rid of them. But the main goal was always find a place to settle and do whatever it takes to the natives to make them accept this and not be a problem. Uh, of course, having a Greek colony, if you didn't care about this tiny strip of coastal land that the Greeks claimed, you often got a very big advantage of having the colony. It was a source of trade. The Greeks had access to the Mediterranean trade network. They could bring in Phoenician stuff. They could bring in stuff from the Middle East. And uh, they, the colony was often not a threat, especially if the area was thinly populated. And the, the colonists were not uh, empires, they didn't conquer large areas. In Syracuse, the remaining Sicils were taken as serfs, and this happened at some places. In almost all places where there were Greek colonies, the Greek culture influences the natives strongly, especially in Italy. Uh, at a later stage, there will be Greek colonies in Egypt, and Egyptians were totally immune to Greek culture. But generally, colonization will lead to Hellenization. And of course, if you remember Almina, the first Greek colony we talked about in the 820s BC, they had no cultural influence over the Phoenicians and the Assyrians. But the colony remained Greek in nature, and they often didn't mix the population in the colony itself. But there was often a peripheral area where uh, the population was mixed. And I want to look specifically at one place. A few episodes back, we established the colonies of Kaimi and Pithecusa. They are at the very north of this map. And they were very close to Etruscan power centers. It's only 40 kilometers from uh, Saimi, Kaimi, Kumai, <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, to uh, Capua, which was an Etruscan power center. And uh, here we see how the Etruscan nobles adopted the Euboean burial practices and the, the whole Greek influence on the Etruscans seems to begin here. And when the Etruscan culture comes down to the Romans, uh, they will be very influenced by this Greek influence on the Etruscans. But there have, seems to have been a very good relationship between the colonists and especially the Etruscans from a very early stage. Uh, I want to talk a little about specific Greek colonies because they will be uh, important to us later. And when I first started doing this episode, I was like gonna do a lot about Syracuse, but I just can't fit it in. 
On eastern Sicily, there were two earlier uh, colonies, Megara Hyblia by Megara in 735 BC, and then Naxus by Chalcis. But in 732, Corinth decided to colonize what will now be uh, Syracuse and what is still Syracuse. And this will, I wanted to mention this specifically because Syracuse will rise at a much later date to be the most powerful Greek city-state of them all. Uh, there are several hundred colonies and I can't mention them all. Uh, every episode I'll do from now on will be boring if I have to spend 10 minutes talking about Greek colonies. So I will mention the most important ones when they are founded, but I thought that in th this episode I will mention a few important ones. Uh, especially uh, Croton in 709 BC, that is in the instep of the Ital Italian boot, that's an important city uh, on, in the Roman conquest of Greece, uh, of Magna Graecia, the Roman conquest of Italy. And we also have Tarentum called Taras, founded by Sparta. This is the only colony that Sparta ever founded, and we'll talk why and how this happened in our next episode when we talk about the Mycenaean War. Uh, there is also Helorus, a colony founded by Syracuse. It's to the south of Syracuse at the bottom of this map. And you see that dates I've given there to the left, they are from uh, Cambridge Ancient History. And the dates on this map, they are not the same. So uh, dates are still very uncertain. But the colonies could themselves found colonies, uh, which is what I wanted to show with this Heloric example. Next episode we'll talk about the first Mycenaean war. Sparta will go to war mid Mycenae and as you probably have not heard much about Mycenae you might guess how that goes but it's a huge war going on a long time and it directly influences the colony of Tarentum. Next episode will then be 730s BC part 3. You can discuss the show with me on YouTube or on Facebook uh, or on iTunes if you want to. Uh, as we have the podcast as well, where I talk with Brennan and we, uh, it's more of a discussion than this more tutorial-like monologue that I'm giving you right now. There is a site, the Fan of History is WordPress.com. Uh, you can find me at uh, the Fan of History on Twitter. And you can also support the whole Fan of History project on patreon.com slash Fan of History. And I really want you to do that because... I am now working as a full-time YouTuber podcaster. And this is my passion, ancient history. It's what I really live for. But yeah, this channel is still pretty small. So I can not I can no longer justify working and doing these episodes weekly. And I don't know how often I will be able to do them. You can directly influence this by becoming a patron of Fan of History. Uh, you... you Decide on a sum that you want to give me for every episode I can complete. And then perhaps one dollar. And then if you reach thirty dollars, we will continue beyond 700 BC. But if, if not, uh, the Fan of History project will change uh, in some way. I might do more World War II stuff, for example, that I think will generate bigger interest. But I have to grow this channel. And this is one way. So if you want to contribute, please do so. You can also, of course, subscribe, like, and share. Um, but the last of the event shows will be 701 BC, the destruction of Sennacherib. Uh, unless the patron hits $30. Thank you so much for watching the Fan of History. And thank you so much for, for paying attention to this project of mine, I, I'm really interested in ancient history and I really want to express it in this way. And you can make that possible. See you next time.